Uh, so it's my great pleasure to present to you Professor Søren Kraushar from the University of Erfurt, Germany. And uh, today he will give a lecture about the theory of reproducing Hardy and Bergman spaces in Altonionic settings. So please, sir. Yeah, thank you so much, Vladislav, and thank you so much to you all. As I already said uh, uh, in the beginning, it is really a great honor to give a talk, to deliver a talk here in this really very famous seminar, which I appreciate a lot. Today, I will speak on a lot of new things which I have been developing together with my colleagues, particular, especially with Fabrizio Colombo and Elaine Sabadini, but also with Denis Constaris from Ghent University during the last couple of years. So basically, uh, shortly before the beginning of the pandemic, I started to dedicate myself to, uh, to octonionic function theory. And uh, why did I become interesting, uh, interested in that? In the, in the times of 2018 and 2019, I recognized there was, uh, uh, there was a, uh, a really strongly growing interest in autonomic function theory. I got more and more really very interesting papers for review uh, in the journals uh, where I'm making the review. And I saw there was a lot of things going on and there was really a growing interest in, yeah, in developing a theory of function spaces in the octonionic setting. So then I also uh, started to look more deeply into it. Well, if one comes from Clifford analysis, one might maybe at the very first sight think that many things go really analogously as in the Clifford analysis setting, because it's also a non-commutative setting, and one of course expects some uh, some trouble, some obstacles because of the lack of associativity. But most of the things I expected, they would go more or less smoothly, or they would not go at all. Well, surprisingly, it became really very different uh, than I thought because uh, the octonionic setting uh, turned out to be really, in many points, essentially different from the Clifford analysis setting, and this made it really interesting. And surprisingly, although we do not have the associativity, which in fact causes a lot of obstacles, but nevertheless, it is still possible to do many things uh, like in the Clifford analysis setting, but using completely or at least really different ideas. So today I would like to give a survey basically on what I did in my previous three papers, as I said, co-authored with Denis Constales in 2021 and co-authored with Fabrizio Colombo and Irene Sabadini from Politecnico di Milano, which we submitted just uh, more or less six weeks ago. So let me just briefly recall how one does calculate in octonians. So I mean, I guess everybody is very familiar with the complex numbers. Then higher dimensional settings are, for instance, four dimensional uh, Hamiltonian quaternions, which form a skew field. But then there are many possibilities to extend quaternions to other to higher dimensions. There is one line of investigation in the framework of associative algebras, as for instance, and Clifford algebras, but one could alternatively also continue the Cayley Dixon duplication process, which actually always doubles complex numbers to quaternions, it doubles quaternions, and then one obtains octonions. But if one follows the Cayley Dixon duplication process, uh, then one already loses at the step of the octonions the associativity. Just roughly speaking, octonions are eight dimensional numbers where we have one real part and we have seven different imaginary parts where the algebra, now in the sense of non-associativity, is generated by three imaginary units and the other imaginary units 
they are formed in exactly that way. So we get a really a closed multiplication structure. We even have invertibility except of the zero element. That is a difference to, uh, to Clifford and algebras. Clifford algebras, we generally, if we go beyond uh, uh, the Hamiltonian quaternions, we will have zero divisors, but in octonians, we do not yet have zero divisors, but we lose the associativity. So we don't have associativity anymore, but we still have another, uh, some other very important calculations rules, namely we still have an alternative composition algebra. We have a couple of, or should I say, substitute calculations rule, which still make our life more or less, uh, or should I say, uh, possible. No. So we still also have a normed division algebra in the sense of non-associativity. We lose a lot of algebraic properties, but we keep important uh, identities that we can still deduce a lot of important properties. If we look at function theory, then for instance, if we go to Clifford analysis, then one usually considers, say, a function from R7 or R8 into the Clifford algebra CL7, which as a vector space is isomorphic to R to the power 128. Now the big advantage, or so let's say a difference, uh, when working with octonians, we now are looking at Maps which really go from an eight dimensional space, also from the octonians, again to the octonians, which is isomorphic to R8. So instead of considering maps from R8 to R128, we now consider maps from R8 to R8. Then there are, as in Clifford analysis, several possibilities to extend the notion of holomorphicity to the octonionic setting. And yeah, a classical uh, setting is that one considers, uh, like in quaternionic or in Clifford analysis, also like in complex analysis, here uh, the octonionic Cauchy Riemann operator, which in the case, if we only would have here one imaginary unit, this was this would nothing be nothing else than the usual Cauchy Riemann operator. So here in this context, we are talking about left or right octonionic monogenic functions if we consider df equal to zero or respectively fd equal to zero. Then we also can use uh, as a conjugation, the octonionic conjugation, which changes the signs over the imaginary units ei. And then we say a function is called left octonionic anti-monogenic if it satisfies d bar f equal to zero. Now, another and really important contrast to Clifford analysis, and this makes the whole talk really, uh, should I say, very different from the Clifford analysis setting is that neither left or right octonionic monogenic functions do form a right or a left octonionic module. In Clifford analysis, one has used that if we have a function in the kernel of the D operator, then also the function multiplied with the Clifford constants remains in the kernel of the operator. And this is in general not true anymore in the non-associative octonionic setting as a consequence of the lack of uh, associativity. So octonionic left monogenic functions, they have not anymore the structure of an octonionic module. Consequently, also on the level of integral formulas, we will see a lot of differences. We don't have, for instance, not anymore have a direct analog of the Stokes formula. So neither if df is equal to zero and gd is equal to zero, we will neither have this equation nor this equation. If we want to have something like a Stokes formula, uh, what do we get? We get the boundary term, we get the volume term, but then we get a correction term. This correction term incorporates the non-associativity. This bracket here is called the associator or the first associator. 
and the bracket of A, B, C measures exactly the non-associativity of three elements. In the associative setting, the associator would always vanish, so in that situation, we would reobtain the classical Stokes formula as we are used to have it. Surprisingly, although we do not have these precise analogs of a Stokes formula, one is still able to prove a very analogous uh, Cauchy integral formula. Namely, Q0y minus x is the Cauchy kernel from R8. So we have y minus x bar divided by y minus x to the power 8 as in the Clifford analysis. But take care. Here you see there are brackets, and the brackets are really important. If you this d sigma y is the um, yeah is the um, oriented surface uh, measure, so the normal vector times uh, the, the scalar surface measure. But it makes a difference if we put here the bracket or if we would put it alternatively on the first two parts, because if we do it differently, then again, the associator enters into the game. So it is a difference uh, how we put the bracket. So one has to be really extremely careful. Besides uh, looking at monogenic generalizations of optonionic monogenic functions, which actually can already be traced back until the 1970s, starting with works of Shea and Antoni in 1973, and then there came later on No No and the Chinese school which was Ching Min Li and Wang and Peng who wrote really a series of really very, very important papers from 2000 until now, which actually also gave myself the inspiration and the motivation to look at this. There are also other possibilities to generalize holomorphicity to the Octonians, namely, for instance, in the slice monogenic setting. Um, what, a slice, what are slice monogenic? Functions. If you have a holomorphic function, you have a real part and an imaginary part. And if you go to higher dimensional, if you go to higher dimensions, you can extend the imaginary part in a kind of actual symmetric way. Uh, let me go a little bit into detail. Actually, as far as I know, uh, the first uh, paper on sliced monogenic octonionic monogenic functions is as far as I know the paper by Struppa and Gentili from 2010 and later on then uh, Perotti and Giloni continued in 2011 and then a lot of and then also Irene Zawadini, Fabrizio Colombo and also the colleagues from China they started to work in this direction and there are several book structures that one considers in this framework but I will basically here restrict on the classical book structure let me say briefly what it is. So, Noctonian has a real part and has seven imaginary parts. On the level of the imaginary parts, we consider now all imaginary Octonians, also where BK is going from K to 107, such that the norm is equal to 1. So, we are dealing with the sphere in the imaginary subspace of R7. So Octonians can be considered as a vector space as R O plus R7, and on the R7 part, we are considering the sphere. If we have one element in the sphere, then this would satisfy I squared equal to minus one. So all elements of the sphere are called imaginary units for any I on S. And if we take one imaginary unit from this imaginary sphere, then what we get is a copy of the complex plane. Yeah? So we have the real part, we have the imaginary part, on the imaginary part we have the sphere, we take an element i of the sphere, and if we then form this set of numbers, what we get is a copy of the complex plane attached to the chosen imaginary. Now, every, every octonian can be always written in terms of a real plot plus IV, 
Ne, with a uniquely defined element of the unit sphere, whenever x is not real. When x is real, then the imaginary part disappears. And then we can also consider the whole sphere associated with such an x. These are namely all octonians, which can be written in the form u plus jv, where j is some element of s and x is some element of the octonian. Now we come to the definition of size monogenic functions and octonians. So if we have a real differential of functions defined yeah, later on, we consider actual symmetric domains mapping into the octonians, then we say that this function is slice monogenic if for every i in S its restriction at i to that complex plane which is spanned by one and the chosen i is this function is holomorphic on the intersection of the domain with this chosen complex plane spanned by the imaginary unit i. So if this cauchy riemann operator living on the i annihilates this function fi. All slice monogenic functions on that domains are then denoted by sm slice monogenic omega. Now, the nice thing is that slice monogenic functions, even in the octonionic settings, have the properties that they can be described in terms of Taylor series, which are constituted by the usual polynomials x octonian to the power n. Namely, in contrast to the monogenic setting, polynomials with coefficients written on the right hand side are in the kernel of this operator. Then one can also write the components of a uh, slice monogenic function in terms of four complex values. What we then obtain is this representation, which we later on will need in our theory, which is called the so-called splitting lemma. We will talk later again on that. But a really striking fact is that uh, that every slice monogenic function has this Taylor series expansion in terms of the usual powers of an octonionic variable. Then we also have a representation formula. If omega is an actual symmetric slice domain, then we can represent the function in terms of that. This is also later on needed. And we also have a Cauchy integral formula, uh, which will be expressed by a kernel function, which is that expression. As far as we know, this formula was first proved by Geloni, Perotti, and Recupero in 2017, as far as I know. Okay, this is a function theoretical background. Let us now talk about function spaces. As I said, a big difference to the classical complex analytic setting is that uh, yeah, that octonionic monogenic or even octonionic slice monogenic functions, they do not form a module. Uh, so we have a problem with these constants. So we have to consider uh, this in the definition of function spaces. The question how to address or how to look at function spaces in the octonionic setting actually goes already back to an old work by Goldstein and Horwitz in 1964. But then really a boost in this direction of research uh, came up with some papers by Hu and Ben in 2021 and in 2021. Let me just briefly recall the definition of an octonionic Hilbert space. What is an octonionic Hilbert space? This is a left octonionic module with an octonionic valued inner product such that uh, if we consider the real part of this octonionic value product, such that this is a real Hilbert space, no? where the real part of the inner product here is denoted by this. The octonionic value inner product is now supposed to satisfy the following rules. We have the additivity, as in the associative case. We have the submission property, we have this positive property, but now we have to be careful. 
as soon as if r is just a real number, then of course a real number associates and even commutates with all the elements which are octonic. So here, if r is real, it is not a problem to throw out this r. And even if r is not real but octonic, if f and g are the same, then we can use Artin's theorem. We can also pull out the outer. But if f and g are octonic functions belonging to some Hilbert space H, and if alpha is an octonic constant, then we cannot expect to pull this out. Then what we are then doing is we are considering pulling it out on the level of the real parts. So we do not require octonionic linearity, but octonionic paralinearity. That means now we consider octonionic valued functionals. For instance, we have an inner product Fg, but we will not require the functional to be linear in the classical sense, demanding that if t acts on f alpha, that we get t of f times alpha. This would be too strong because we do not have the structure of an octonionic module in the classical sense. So instead of demanding this, one needs to replace this condition by a weaker one, namely by the weaker notion of octonionic paralinearity. This was also again suggested by Guang Benren and his co authors in his 2022 papers. Now we say that an octonionic functional is all paralinear if the real part of this expression, which we call the second associator, if the real part is equal to zero. So we do not demand the equality here, but we demand that the real part of this equality should be satisfied. Actually, following Ren and his co-authors, this condition can also be interpreted equivalently as the real part of F alpha G should be the same as the real part of the inner product of F G alpha. So this will be the correct substitution. So now we have what we have, what we can do to study function spaces in the octonians. How can we define Hardy spaces in the octonionic monogenic setting? First of all, we say H2 d omega O is supposed to be the closure of all functions which are octogonic valued functions, uh, uh, two integrable over the boundary, and they should be octogonic homogenic functions inside of omega, and they should have continuous extensions to the boundary. And now, actually, how do I came to the definition for? To get to this definition, I was inspired by previous works of Wang and Lee 2018 and 2020, who tried to introduce the Bergman and the Segel kernel for the unit ball and the half space. And surprisingly, uh, they uh, did not consider the usual uh, inner product G bar F, but they considered in the unit ball the expression X times G of X bar times uh, X times F of X. But surprisingly, when they looked at the half space in 2020, they didn't use the factor X. But this gave me the idea to make it work to really get a uh, an octonionic function space, we need something like an intrinsic weight factor. So to make everything works and to make everything compatible with definitions and to also ensure that we get something like a reproducing kernel, at least on the level of the, uh, of the, of the real parts, it was important to insert here an intrinsic weight factor, namely the unit normal field. So we have a domain, we should, this domain should be sufficiently smooth. The exterior unit normal should uh, actually exist uh, almost everywhere. And this n of x is the unit normal vector at the boundary, which is supposed to actually to exist almost everywhere. If we were in an associative setting, Please uh, remember uh, the bar switches the order. And if we could uh, switch the parentheses, then 
n bar x, also n x bar times n of x, I mean, the conjugate of the normal field times the normal field, the normal field has norm one, this was exactly disappeared. So this is really an octonionic intrinsic factor. Note that this inner product is only R linear and not octonionic linear, but if we check uh, uh, the, the conditions that I showed on, this, on, the, on, the, on the previous slide, then we see this is O per linear. So we can indeed prove that, okay, we do not have the octonionic linearity of this inner product, but these substitution rules are all satisfied. Since we do not have the strong octonionic linearity, please take care, we do not have a Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. And this also means we do not get a direct analog of the Fischer-Ries representation theory using this inner product. But we keep in mind, we are dealing with an octonionic Hilbert space in the weaker sense of the previous definition, namely requiring the paralinearity instead of the strong definition of the linearity. Now the idea, how do we get a reproducing kernel without having something like a Cauchy-Schwarz inequality? This was a brilliant idea from my colleague, Denis Constalis from Ghent University, who told me, well, so try to look at the real part of the functions. And every octonionic function has a real part and then reproduce every real part separately. And then you get, you can reproduce it separately, no? and then try to lift this again up again to, uh, to one octonionic function. This is actually the idea. So in this way, we can define partial and total Zabel projections, and we also come even to reproducing curves. It is very astonishing. The paper of Wang and Lee, they compute the Segel kernel, but they have not yet given uh, the theoretical background of the Hardy spaces and of existence and uniqueness. But the formula that they gave turned out to be completely true. And it was really what we need, namely this function here is really the Segel kernel of the unit ball when considering the normal field, which in that situation ne, is uh, just looking at the time, ne, uh, is exactly uh, the outer unit field. Then in a paper which I published in Mathematical Methods in the Applied Sciences, I was also able to compute the Segel kernel for the right octonionic half space, which turns out to have exactly the same formal structure as in the Clifford case. And in the case of considering strip domains bounded in the real dimension, I was also able to uh, extend the calculations that I did previously with the Lee Constalis on the Clifford case in 2021 to the octonionic case. So here also we were able to produce an explicit Segel kernel, uh, which is then reproducing the function even on the level of the full octonionic product. Just to give you a proof of the formula for the unit ball, uh, here it is very important to have this intrinsic weight factor inside. Now, this factor is crucial to make the whole argumentation work because finally the idea is to use at the end the Cauchy integral formula, which we have. And to use that, the presence of the weight factor is really crucial. So it is not something like you add on, it is really necessary to really get a unique function uh, kernel. So without the weight factor, uh, I'm not sure whether we can have a, a kernel or whether we can have uniqueness, but in the setting of this weight factor, we get a uniquely reproducing kernel. Okay, uh, so assume that T is the O-paralinear uh, functional representable with the global kernel function K in this way, then we can also associate an adjoint operator on the level of the real parts. I mean, here 
if we talk about self adjointness, we always need to split the octonionic product in the real parts and to work on the level of the real parts where we incorporate the O parallel paralinearity property. So this is very important. We cannot expect such a relation on the level of the full octonionic product. Okay. Now something, now uh, really some things which uh, were developed now very recently, which are now part of the new paper submitted together with Irene and Fabrizio. Uh, so basically until now, this was basically the background that I had before I came to Milan uh, last spring and then I had my sabbatical. Uh, at Politecnico de Milano, and then we were able to yeah, go much deeper and find out much more. First of all, a big question was, uh, how can we define the analogous, uh, the analogous tools to study Bergman spaces of octonionic monogenic functions? And amazingly, also in the Bergman setting, we found out that also there, we need to require intrinsic weight factors in the difference of the inner product. So normally one is used, I mean, the Bergman kernel is related to a volume integral. Uh, volume, differential form is a scalar form and we have inside G bar times F. And in fact, we are integrating over the whole volume. So it would be really very, very uh, natural to say, okay, we define the inner product as in the usual way by G bar F. But we would enter exactly with the same problem. Since we do not have octonionic linearity on the level of the full octonionic product, and if we want to identify somehow the Cauchy integral formula uh, to have a unique uh, uh, Bergman kernel, we would get into problems. And now the idea was to introduce, as in the Hardy space, weight factors here in this definition. But there is something which is different in that setting. I don't know if you can also see, maybe the board here is too far away. Uh, yeah, otherwise, I could draw something. Um, if we have a domain, suppose now that the domain is bounded and the domain has a nice boundary. Then the first idea would be we could insert here somehow the outer normal field. But take care, if we integrate over x, we are integrating not over points of the boundary, but we are integrating over the volume. So how can we define a weight factor which in some sense could be associated somehow um, dum -dum, with the normal field. Well, I will try. I don't know if you can see it. Yes, we, we can see the. the uh, yeah. Uh -huh. Imagine if we have here a domain, and if we are inside the domain. If we, if the domain is very nice, then we could be lucky that we find a point on the boundary which is uniquely defined as being the nearest point of this point. This, of course, does only work in special domains. But imagine if you have a domain, uh, maybe this domain is maybe not, let's better say, let us take a complex domain, let us take something that convex domain, and then we have a point here, and in that situation, we can easily, for instance, find a point which is the closest point, and this then is the normal here associated to that. This point I call x tilde. So as soon as we think we have points with the property that we can associate the nearest point on the boundary, we can actually define in some sense a function n of x uh, that is associated to the normal. The problem is if we have a point where we have points here, here we have this nearest point, but also this, 
So if we have, for instance, ellipse, then there are points which have the property that that is that uh, do not exist in nearest point, but that we have many points that we have ambiguity. But for instance, in that case, the set of points with this ambiguity has the property that its Lebesgue measure in the interior is equal to zero. And if we have a Lebesgue measure set of measure of equal to zero, then this does not count in the integration. So as soon as our domain is, for instance, convex bounded with the property that one can accept of a set of Lebesgue measure zero, always associate to a point X, the nearest point on the boundary, then we can, for instance, define the weight factor as the value of the point of the normal field that we get at the nearest points. This, of course, is a assumption that we have to take. Well, let us take two or three examples. If we, for instance, have the unit ball, how is the situation there? To every point except of the center point, which is a pure point, we have one uniquely defined nearest point in the boundary. The only point where we do have ambiguity is exactly the origin. But this is just one point, and it has actually it has zero, uh, it has Lebesgue measure zero. And yeah, on the on the upper half space, uh, if we go to the half space, then the situation is even easier. Huh? If we are here on the right half space, here's a point, we always find one point still, uh, which is the closest one. What is in the strip domain? In the strip domain, it's actually similar. The only problematic set is that is a set in the middle of this set as level measure zero. So here in this situation, we can also define this weight factor in that way. And yes, exactly. So like this, we can sensefully introduce this kind of inner product for. kernel of the unit ball and the upper half space and all the formulas that they gave they are incorporated in this more general setting by these particular cases so it is not totally crazy to make this kind of definition it is amazingly but this definition works as we will later on see also at the slice monogenic setting it really turns out to be an intrinsic ingredient in the octonionic setting to work with intrinsic weight factors of uh, yeah of uh, length one. So like this, we are able to define the space of octonionic valued functions B two omega, no, which are all L two integrable functions over volume, which are annihilated by the octonionic cauchy riemann operator inside. This we will refer to as the Bergman space of left octonionic monogenic functions. This inner product, of course, also reproduces the usual norm. And we can then prove that exactly if we use this definition, we really have an octonionic space in the sense of the definition of Goldstein and Horwitz and of Ren and Hu. Now it is very funny if we use this these weight factors, then we discover the formula for the Bergman kernel of the unit ball and of the right half space provided by Van and Lee in 2018, respectively 2020. We are able to recover exactly these two formulas in the setting. As mentioned in the beginning, in these papers, the authors provided formulas for the Bergman kernels, but they did not provide a general uh, theory of saying what is exactly a Bergman space, what is exactly a Bergman kernel, one does it exist, one is it uniquely defined. So these were questions which we analyzed now in the previous time.
And also on the level of the strip domain, I was able to prove this formula, which was already published in my paper of MMIS in 2021. Now let me come to the last chapter, uh, namely to explain how one can extend this to the slice monogenic setting. The nice thing is that slice monogenic functions if we are in the particular setting of the unit ball, then, then, we can repro then we can represent them in terms of Taylor series containing the classical complex power series. And on the level of their coefficients, we can also introduce or describe the inner product. So uh, in the slice monogenic settings, there are several ways to describe the inner product namely in a geometric way, which we are doing here in definition seven, which is the analog of the definitions, or uh, is now in definition here one, which are the analogs of the definitions I gave in the monogenic settings. But we shall see that we can alternatively and fully equivalently also define the octonionic inner products on the level of the Taylor coefficients. And this is something really nice and an added value of the sliced monogenic setting, because as far as I know, we do not have exactly this close analogy in the monogenic setting. So let us from now on that omega, uh, suppose that omega in O is such that omega, if we restrict omega to one of these complex planes, namely take an I from the sphere, take the associated complex plane takes the intersection of that domain with the plane. So basically you have a huge domain, you intersect it with a complex plane, and then you have an intersection, which we call omega intersected CI. This intersection in this complex plane has of course boundary, and this boundary is denoted by d sigma intersected with CI. And uh, now we first define, and this is the geometrical definition of the slice monogenic Hardy spaces. We call H2 omega O the closure of the set of slice monogenic functions on omega that belong to L2 d omega intersected with CI such that this integral here is finite and ds of z now is the arc element. So we are not dealing with the surface element, we are now dealing with the arc element. And now to introduce uh, an inner product being compatible with all these calculation rules, we now have again to use these intrinsic factors, these intrinsic weight factors. Note that we can write the arc element on the omega intersected with CI as a product of the unit tangential field denoted by T of Z times uh, the modulus of D S of Z, which is simply the line, the scalar line differential. No? Again, if we take here the step of the normal field, we are taking here the tangential field, the unit tangential field. So we require that T Z squared bar is equal to one equal to T Z bar T Z. And then we define analogously as we did in the monogenic case, but now on the level of each complex slice, you know, this inner product here containing now the unit tangential field you know, of the boundary arc element in the definition of the inner product. This in fact is a bilinear form. Of course, it depends on the choice I of S. Then to reproduce, we again have to consider separately each real part and to reproduce each real part separately and all the same stuff as in the monogenic setting. And we can prove that exactly that this definition gives rise to an octonionic Hilbert space in the sense of the definition by Goldstein and Moritz. Yes. Okay. You can still hear me. I heard the noise. Everything okay? Yes, Everything is perfect. Perfect, perfect. I, I heard a noise. <laughs> I was a little bit worried that, <laughs> but I'm still online. Perfect, great. Let me just briefly round off to give here these nice features on the unit case. The additional feature here is 
that in the octonionic uniball case, using the slice monogenic setting, that we can provide a sequential characterization in terms of the Taylor coefficients. Namely, if f and g are slice monogenic on the unit ball, we can represent them in terms of these, uh, yes, in terms of these uh, series. And then we can alternatively also define an all-valued inner product here on the level of the coefficients. And we can show that these definitions, also this definition that I gave here, and the definition that I gave previously, that these definitions are completely equivalent, but one has to make a lot of calculations. Now we don't have the time to do that, but we can prove that these two definitions are completely equivalent. We also can say what is exactly the Siegel kernel. Oh, I think the battery here is low. If you can't, this is somehow strange. Uh, the battery of uh, the camera seems to be low. It's not okay. Otherwise, I have to switch here to the computer. Um, you know, so well, now we can, everything is okay. It's okay, a perfect, perfect. Yeah, so we can also give explicit formulas for the Siegel kernel, which is exactly also uh, a derivation here of the Cauchy kernel for the slice monogenic case. And we can really show uh, that we have the equivalence of these two types of definitions. The nice thing is that we can switch from the geometrical definition to the sequential definitions. So, for instance, we can also prove the reproduction property on the level of the coefficients. First of all, notice also that the Siegel kernel can also be written in that way. And so we can also use uh, it on the level here of the Taylor series. Here, in fact, to show the equivalence of both definitions, namely to say that that we have it, that this definition of the octonionic valued inner product using the Taylor coefficients and that definition using this definition here, that these two definitions are equivalent. Né? This can be shown by the tools of using sliced monogenic analysis. Here, yeah, I don't have the time to do that, but yeah, one can use especially the splitting lemma and the representation formula to derive here these identities and to show that we really have this equivalence. Okay, what did we do more? We were able to, uh, I mean, this was the unit uh, ball setting. We could also derive similar results for the setting of the right half space and even for the strip domain. And we were also able to provide explicit representation formulas for the reproducing kernel functions of the slice, monogenic functions in these settings. And additionally, we were also able to transfer the Bergman theory also to the slice monogenic case, although there the unipole case has turned out to be extremely interesting because also in the setting of the unit ball in the Bergman situation, we were able to provide a sequential characterization using Taylor coefficients similar uh, to the slice monogenic Clifford setting described in papers by Kamal Dickey, for instance, and together with Daniel Alpay and Irene and Fabrizio now in the last two, three years. And I would also like to mention that we were also able, uh, at least in the monogenic setting, we also developed uh, agreements of the Kurzmann-Stein theory for octonionic monogenic functions. Uh, Basically, uh, these results can be found in detail in these three references. So uh, the monogenic theory of the Hardy spaces and together with Kurtzman Stein, this is, can be found in my joint paper with the Econ Stahlers in 2021. The formulas for the Bergman and the Siegel kernels for the monogenic settings can be found in my paper of mathematical methods and the applied sciences. 
and the whole theoretic background, including now also the new results, the transference to the case of the slice monogenic settings, can be found in our new preprint together with Fabrizio and Irene. This preprint is already available on the server of Politecnico de Milano in the digital collection of the mathematics, and it is now under review, and we hope to get it accepted very soon. Now I look to my watch. I think now we have exactly, yes, Portuguese time 50-50. So, yes, it worked exactly yeah. <laughs> in this time framework. So I would like to thank you very, very much for your attention and your interest. And I would really like to stress it was an honor to give this talk here in this wonderful audience. Thank you. Very thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sören, for, for the very interesting talk. It was really interesting to see the progress in this field. And uh, if there are questions, please. So, so then, uh, um, I, I have a small question. Uh, yes. I saw several papers uh, dedicated to some applications of uh, octonionic uh, uh, monogenic functions, yes. uh, including to uh, electrodynamics. So people try to, to uh, yes. look for, for applications uh, at, at that direction. So uh, if there is some hope to to apply the results on Hardy and Bergman uh, spaces, for example, representations to in, in this uh, field. Definitely, yeah, yeah. Because now we also have limited projection formulas, and then we can consider the behavior. We can consider uh, what happens at the boundary. So I mean, we can. We now have the theory d f equal to zero, but we can also consider d minus lambda f equal to zero. So basically, we can use actually, uh, or should I say, the, the, uh, we now have a toolkit available, not everything, but we have a couple of toolkits available, similarly to Gerlebeck and Streusig books and your books that we can also apply to, to octonionic Maxwell equations. But by the way, uh, uh, you mentioned the Cauchy formula, and uh, if there are Clemens Sochotsky formula, uh, formulas available already. Yes. There is a paper by uh, Chantao, Xing Min Li, and Chantao, and uh, in 2010, uh, and they already considered the Cauchy transform together with Plemmel projection formulas. They did not look at the adjoint, so the adjoint and the Kurtzman Stein, this was our new contribution. But uh, Chantao uh, and Xing Min Li and Peng, they already looked at the Cauchy transform together with. With Plemmel Zohotsky formulas. So this was yeah, in 2010, yeah, or 2008. Yes, exactly. But it was in that time, yeah. Okay, thank and you. Of course, you have the link, of course, you can, if you have these operators P and Q. I mean, now you also have the Bergman. Now you can also consider what is now new. Now you also have the Bergman and the Hardy theory. Now you can also consider the, the orthogonal projectors so that we can now actually provide similar tools as, for instance, provided in the book of Gerlebeck and Strassig uh, using these projection operators yeah, to describe solutions of related partial differential equations. I mean, there is a lot of things that can now be done really in the near future. And of course, also you also look with your colleagues at the at eigenfunctions of the D operator to split the Helmholtz operator. I mean, also this machinery, uh, now we also have a more complete background to also uh, go more into detail in this study of this direction. So we hope that we can provide some uh, yeah, some complementary uh, uh, new tools that we can also go into a deeper study in this direction. Okay, thank you. Actually, it's actually very interesting that uh, now in the last two years there also appeared a lot of new papers on the magnetohydrodynamic equations where the octonians really seem to be a, really a new feature which turned out to be useful. So 
there is more and more an interest in that direction also from the part of applications. So it is nice to have a machinery like in the book of Klaus Golebeck and Wolfgang Strassig to also look at these particular physical problems. So I think they are, uh, it can be used for a lot of things in that direction. Thank you. So more questions, please. May I ask one question? Yes. Um, I understand that uh, since you are speaking about reproducing kernel, then you have integral representation for functions, right, from the corresponding space. Yes. So this integral representation is pointwise. Are there any condition of functions to have this pointwise representation, like integrability condition or something else? Mm -hmm. Uh, say it again, it, it did not arrive acoustically completely. So, uh, could you repeat the question, please? I mean, uh, for your representation, you have a representation of function in terms of uh, corresponding kernel, right? Integral uh, function kernel. So, are there any condition, additional conditions in this case to have this representation point wise? I did not really this completely. So, um, but you you have representation in terms of your your kernel, right? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. These representations, of course, they are valid for particular domains. We have explicit so we have explicit representation formulas, for instance, for the unit ball, for the right half space, for for the string domain. And uh, we can, of course, use this theory to now say if we have domains with these extra special conditions, then we get a uniquely defined Bergman kernels on the level of the real parts, and then one can lift it to an octonionic function. I mean, of course, uh, yeah, we have these special domains, so we, to make the theory work, we have to, for instance, require uh, that we have these weight factors and so on. Okay. And one more question, maybe. Um, you spoke about duality, I guess. So, do you use kind of interpolation or do you study interpolation of this function yes, spaces? So we are still on the starting point of this. So, we were to go in another paper with Denis Constalis. Uh, we were trying to approximate uh, the, um, the Sega projection in terms of Kurtz von Stein operators. So, basically, what we did, we have the Optimally Cauchy transform, we have sent the adjoint transform. Then we take the difference of the Cauchy transform and the adjoint transform. We get a compact operator, what we call the octonionic Kurtzmann-Stein operator, which is in the half space closely related to the Ries, to the Hilbert Ries transform. And uh, yeah, and now uh, one can use these Kurtzmann operators to approximate uh, yeah, the Segel projection. In terms of these, these compact operators. But also, this is already it is still at the very beginning. I mean, the Kurtzmann Stein theory is a little bit more complicated in the setting because also here the lack of associativity does not allow us to draw some immediate conclusion that we have in the complex or the Clifford setting. So we always have to go an extra mile. So there are still a lot of open questions, but we are exactly looking in that direction. Yeah, I see that you are constructing basics of the theory and it looks exactly. like very nice. Very nice. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. More questions, please. So I think. This is not the case. I, I cannot see. If there are some hands there, probably not. So thank you very much, uh, sir, once more for, for the very interesting lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much.